and welcome to tonight's policy pitch. My name is Peter McMahon. I'm the Director of Community Engagement here at the Library. Tonight's event is being held on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation. I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners and to pay my respects to their elders and to the elders of any other communities who may be with us this evening. I'd like to start by welcoming the members of tonight's panel. Marjorie Evans, Simon Kent, Coralie Pratt, and at the end, Dr. Peter Goss. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to Grattan Institute members and staff, and also to members of our Friends of the Library program. As you may know, the policy pitch provides a platform to generate conversation, debate, and ideas on key public policy. And it brings together some of the foremost thinkers in their chosen fields and tonight is no exception. Drawing on a wealth of experience in schools and education policy, we will hear from our panel of experts on the topic of targeted teaching, how to close the gap between theory, policy, and practice. To introduce our guest speakers and lead the discussion, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Goss, School Education Program Director at Grattan Institute. Peter has over 10 years experience as a strategy consultant, most recently with Boston Consulting Group, advising federal and state governments on service delivery innovation. He's worked with Noel Pearson to improve education outcomes for Cape York primary school students and has advised the federal government on the future of international education in Australia. Please join me in welcoming Peter Goss. Thank you. And welcome to all of you for what should be a fascinating evening. Um, firstly, I would like to thank the State Library of Victoria who supports these regular policy pitches. It's a great opportunity for us to talk about issues that we care about with people who also care about those issues and can shed some light and to have an engaged conversation with a very diverse audience. I'd also like to thank our Grattan affiliates who support us and help make some of this work possible. In terms of the audience, thank you for coming along on what's turned out to be a beautiful evening. Um, in the audience, we have roughly 30 schools from the government sector, the Catholic sector and the independent sector. We have representative of all, all three of those sectors. We have several universities, policymakers, some academics who have been involved in some of the foundational thinking in this space and uh, also many people who are generally interested. So I'm very excited to have that diversity. The core challenge that I'm going to talk about and we're going to talk about today is something called targeted teaching. And Grattan Institute published a report on this about six or seven weeks ago that noted what it was, but noted that there was a problem that it wasn't happening well enough. And so the panel members today have been chosen because they are in various levels, either at the front line or in the policy space, involved in taking some of these ideas from the theory and the policy and helping them to be put into practice. So, I would first of all like to welcome Coralie Pratt, who is the principal of Camberwell South Primary School, um, who is doing some fantastic work at the front line in actually helping her school change into a place where every student's learning is focused every day at the right level. Secondly, I'd like to uh, introduce Simon Kent, uh, who is wo working at the Department of Education and Training He's the Deputy Secretary in charge of the strategy there. And in that work, he is leading a very important reform in Victoria called the Education State. Some of you may have noticed that there was a political announcement yesterday. There was also a, pol there was also a policy announcement and a, a deeply important one, although it might have got less media because of other things that were going on in Canberra. Um, that's a document called The Education State for Schools. Simon is the man who is leading this and we uh, hope to hear a bit more about that tonight. And finally, Marjorie Evans, who is the foundational CEO of AITSL, the Australian Institute of Teaching and School Leadership, having had many roles in many different parts of Australia, from the front line now up to leading policy. And Marjorie's team helps set the standards. What do we expect from teachers and from principals and how to help them implement some of these? So could you please welcome very warmly Coralie, Simon and Marjorie. Thank you. 
We have about 75 minutes. I'll try to, I'll, I will try to keep to time. Um, we're going to spend about 40 minutes in a panel discussion covering four questions. What is targeted teaching? What does it look like? What are the current policy settings? And how do we move to somewhere closer to it? And then we'll move to audience Q&A. Many of you were kind enough to send through some questions and I tried to incorporate these um, where I could. So, to start off, why is targeted teaching important? And I'll put a, put a starting view out here. There's a great inefficiency at the heart of Australian education today, but it's largely hidden. The students who are affected by it might even call it a great injustice. Every school day and every lesson, a substantial proportion of the roughly 3.5 million students in Australia will not be learning well. Sometimes that's because of factors beyond the classroom, and that's really hard to deal with, and teachers do heroic efforts in that. But, but too often, it's because the teaching is pitched at a level that is either too easy, in which case the children are bored and not learning much, or too hard, in which case they're lost, bored, and potentially disruptive. These students are not learning at their best. There's a better way. We know in theory that the answer is to teach at a level which is at the right level for each child, for what they need to learn next. And we've known this for a long time. It's written into our professional standards. Although it's hard, there are pockets of great practice. And the challenge is now how to move from pockets of great practice to a system where every student is taught at the level that is right for them as much time as possible. That's why I think targeted teaching is important. But I understand that I'm not the first person to have noticed this, so I'm going to hand over to Coralie on that. To start, Peter, I'd like to thank you for inviting me tonight. I feel very humbled to be in this position. I'm usually, like you, sitting in the audience and admiring the people on the stage, so I hope I can add value to the conversation this evening. We can't ignore the importance of targeted teaching, and um, my background is in early childhood initially, and so I really admire the work of Lev um, Bielski and the work, the idea of um, students learning best when they're in the, the zone. And to get them in the zone, we have to have information about that and knowledge about how they are learning, how they're travelling and where, where they are at a certain time in their learning. And to determine that, what they already know and then and scaffold that work around it. So the concept of targeted teaching just fits naturally with what I really truly believe. We can't ignore it because there's so much research that shows us that we have to start with what children understand before we go any further. At my school currently, and this previous school, which I'll talk about a bit further in the conversation, we've been influenced by the work of Jeff Masters and ACR, um, reforming um, educational assessment. It's been very important to us. Also the work of Dylan Willem. Um, Willem talks about formative assessment and he says in his work that if there's only one thing you do for school improvement, do formative assessment in your school. And that's been the basis of our work over the last few years. I know from first-hand experience that targeted teaching does make a difference. It does drill down to that individual level. Uh, my previous school in Queensland, for three years, school of 1,100 students, we use targeted teaching as our main strategy, along with the National School Improvement Tool developed by ACR. The school's achievements showed, though, for NAPLAN, for example, in NAPLAN, is three, five, and seven below national minimum standards in nine areas of the 15 areas. In 2013, so the fourth year of implementation, the school was the most improved school in the whole of Queensland, most improved government school in Queensland. I've got no doubt those strategies added to that. So the, uh, it's still relevant today in the classroom, even though it is quite old. And you showed me just before uh, um, that it's, it's not new. It's, how old is the book that you had that talks about this? 1923. <laughs> Trash and Treasure. I've used it on many occasions. It's called Individualised Work in the Infant School. And there's some fantastic quotes from that. And I've used it with... Um, leadership development and uh, as well as how to identify individual needs in students. And there's some great quotes in there. So Simon, thank you. Simon, why do you care about these ideas? Um, well, for, also thank you for the invitation to be here and I'm really pleased uh, 
when, uh, when you invited me that uh, I saw this date in the, in, in the diary and thought we're doing something the day before, or at least we were planning on doing something the day before, and, um, and that plan stuck, so I'm very pleased to be here on, on the other side of the announcement, which uh, includes uh, some, some very clear references to targeted teaching and what we can do, which we'll come to. Um, I suppose, you know, as a, as a non-educator, um, uh, I kind of reduce it to something pretty simple, that if you don't know, uh, if, if you don't know what a kid knows, how can you know what to teach them next? It's just so obvious when you say it like that. Um, and why, do, why am I interested in it um, as, a, as a policy maker, as an advisor to government, uh, is effect size. That's, that's what uh, we chase in, in developing policy and strategies. So Could you explain effect size? Many will know it. Not um, so what, how much gain do you get for the intervention? Uh, and this, this consistently comes through research as, as being a very high effect size. So it's a, it's a common uh, issue for, uh, for us in developing policy that there are uh, tens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of things that can be done that are all positive because you're putting in effort. You're going to get something at, um, out the other end, or you certainly hope you will. It's, it's what's the return on that effort, and uh, this has a very high return. So focusing our effort on the things that give the greatest return uh, is, is a, a key thing to be uh, pursuing as a system, to say, focus, 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 on the things that are going to get the greatest return, not just any return. Marjorie, this is a deeply embedded in some of the things that uh, Aitzel says, but where do you see this fitting into the range of things that could be done and amongst the ones that should be done? So again, like my colleagues, thank you very much for the invitation, Peter. One of the things I think we have to be careful about when we talk about targeted teaching is not to make assumptions that uh, each day is a new experience for every teacher and every uh, student. So Simon picks, has picked that up to some extent and I think we have to be ca cautious, thoughtful about what can be achieved in classrooms and what, uh, and what can be practically achieved. So of course best teaching occurs when uh, we're well aware of what kids are interested in, what they know, that um, some learning has become automatic for them and so that they can learn the next a new thing. But we also need to recognise that uh, there are things that, as Simon says, work best and they're the things that we should focus on. But what works best for one child won't necessarily work best for another. So I'm having a bob to way here, Peter, by saying that there are some practical and pragmatic issues that we need to deal with when we think about targeted teaching. What's highest probability interventions? What are, what sort of, uh, what things in my repertoire should I apply uh, to the children in my class or the individuals at this time to have the greatest effect. But simultaneously, I need to think about how am I going to capitalise uh, on individual skills, you know, within a, a, an individual needs within a, a, a particular time period. So it's that thing about what's common about teaching, what's the, the stuff we know that works and therefore where should I put my effort balanced against what are the individual needs of particular students and my capacity to know and understand that and my capacity to understand the impact I have as a teacher on, uh, on individual children so I know which of the things within my repertoire to pick. So targeted teaching I think is inclusive of all of those things in a context that needs to be relatively pragmatic. I would agree. Um, I think it is, definitely does need to be pragmatic. There's no point having a concept that is actually not practical. Um, and we spend a lot of time when we were researching the report trying to find where are there schools that are doing this. So we've talked at a high level about why we find this interesting. Let's get down to the next level, which is what is it? How does it work? And uh, the core idea is to ensure that the level of teaching is at an accessible level for each student. Um, and we ha I've put on the seats a uh, sheet there, it's got two sides. Um, if you turn to the one that has the picture on it, um, I'll give a very quick overview of how we described it. 
Um, but it's really important to Marjorie your point that this is no magic bullet. It's about how does this work in, in practice in the classroom amidst the myriad of other factors that teachers have to deal with. Um, but what we would say, based on the research, is that targeted teaching is going to happen best when, one, the teachers assess what the students already know. As Simon said, that's a baseline for every student from where you can set an appropriate learning goal. Secondly, the teachers have to actually respond to that. And one of the reasons that hasn't come up yet why this is so hard is because not all students are at the same level in a class. If they were, it would be really quite easy to teach. Um, however, every teacher who's ever, ever lived knows that there is a range of abilities in the class. But maybe not quite what that range is. The data show that within a typical classroom there is a five to six year gap in current ability. What that means is that if you're a teacher of a year eight class, you may well have students who are operating in their mathematical understanding or in their writing or reading at a year three or four level. You might also have some students that are operating at a year nine or 10 level. If every one of those students gets the same tasks and is expected to perform them at the same level, it's not gonna work that well. Other examples say it's actually up to an eight-year gap in some of the mathematical understanding uh, um, that is required to, uh, to keep going. So somehow, and we, try, we have not been too prescriptive, we have tried to describe what it looks like um, when schools try to, and teachers try to face this gap, and target teaching to address what each student is ready to learn next. Thirdly, you want to track the progress of all of your students tracking the progress so that students can perform more difficult tasks than they were a while ago is at the heart of schools. I think sometimes we would call that learning. Um, and we want to know that every child is learning. Um, and that requires both evidence that the teacher just gathers on their day-to-day -day basis about what's happening and then ideally cross-checking that so that we can say, are students learning enough? As Simon said, nearly everything works so that students learn, but we want to know our students learning enough so they will get to a level that, where they'll be able to thrive in life. That also helps identify if a student has stalled in their learning, and then you can do something about it. And then finally, to take that information about what have we done and how well has it worked, both Simon and, uh, and Marjorie talked about that, and to say, can we understand what it is that has worked best and do more of it, and what it is that hasn't done as well in terms of maximising student learning, and then either change it or adjust it. So that's the broad concept there that I'd like to put on the table. Um, anything to add, but I, I'm keen to say, what does it look like in practice in a school? But anything to add before that? Coralie, I over to you. I think this is a typical example of what, what Michael Fullen calls simplexity. A simple concept, but the complexity in detail. And, and it is a journey. And I think we need, to, we need to start with winning, capturing the hearts of our teachers, hearts and minds of why you need to do it. And my mantra has always been that we need to use data because it's a tool that will support you. It will help, it's a tool of your trade and you need to, to be able to rely on that. And I have seen that increase um, teachers' confidence talking to parents because they can use the data to um, justify, to inform their judgments. I've seen build their professional credibility and it also supports them in the classroom in planning the curriculum that's appropriate and then monitoring, identifying individual students that need that extra intervention, whether it's um, support or extension, which are both important. I think that the key is the leadership in the school. You have to be committed, you have to understand why you're pr promoting this and you have to be consistent in application and you have to be brave, you have to be courageous because sometimes people um, don't want to go on the journey but you have to help them to understand why we need to do that. So in practical terms, what we have done at Campbellwell South is to start with we uh, audited our current assessment tools we were using, we identified what we wanted, we wanted tools that, had, um, that we could use every year that gave us good information about students and we wanted tools that we could triangulate data with. So for instance, in, uh, for mathematics, we use the um, progressive assessment tool, maths. 
we are implementing the early years numeracy interview because that's on a developmental continuum and then we triangulate that with our um, portfolio of tasks which are assessed against the OSVAL standards. Cor Coralie, could you uh, explain maybe what a developmental continuum is? It shows what the st where the students have been and where they need to go next. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, OK, early years numeracy interview is fantastic, but it's very time consuming and you're absolutely correct. So another thing a leader needs to do is to be innovative and a risk taker. So what we've done is we've we wanted to have some benchmark data. So every student from foundation prep to year four has been, um, have, we've got information about from the early years numeracy interview. And then students we felt were at risk from years five and six. So a huge amount of work. So we approached Deakin University and we've sort of developed a, a partnership with them, a relationship where we're training pre-service trainee teachers on how to implement the, um, the interview and in return they're gaining that knowledge and they're, interview and they're implementing it at the school. So it's a win-win situation. I agree if you're thinking that, sitting there thinking the teacher should be doing this, I agree. So the students at the highest risk, the, te the classroom teacher is doing the interview, but it was impossible to get that data for all those students because of the um, intensity. But we think the value we gained from it is really important. And so Coralie, I think that gives an indication, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the test, these are tests that are detailed enough to give precise information that can be compared over time. Um, and that gathers a lot of data. How does this change what happens in the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis? This informs the, the curriculum, the, the classroom planning, so the teachers can then identify, particularly through the, the items, test items, what they need to be focusing on. Previously, um, it was more of this is what happens every second term, or term three, term four, the, the, the content was set. Now it's much more needs based. Now we know this is happening because um, after we triangulated the data in 2014, we found that the students that we identified that should have individual learning plans, and I believe all children should have them, all students should, but at this stage it was just the, the two ends of the, the cohort. We identified that no student was on a learning plan that should have been, and in fact three times the number should have been on a learning plan, and that there were students on a learning plan that shouldn't have been on it. Uh, they were getting confused with behaviour. Now we couldn't have had that conversation before if we didn't have that data. That's what's really empowered those conversations. And the need for accountability is another really important area perhaps we'll go into later. And, and my last question, and this is one from the audience, a couple of similar questions. Um, how do you set up the classroom organisation to be able to do this in practice? Teachers um, have a lot of groups. This is normal practice in classrooms. Group work, but group work isn't rotating activities. The group work is related directly back to what the students already know and taking them that next step forward. And of course, then open-ended tasks are also very important to um, for students to be able to progress at their own rate. You'll see the students, you'll see the teachers interacting with it with a certain group. They might be um, assessing or monitoring achievement and progress, but also flowing through the room understanding what the other groups are doing. It's, it's, not, it's nothing new. I'm sure your schools are doing the same thing. It's just that we're starting from a much stronger database than we ever have before. So I really wanted to have Coralie as someone who is living with this on a day-to-day -day basis, recognising that it is possible, recognising I think it's maybe a little harder than you're making it sound um, to do it systematically and to put it into every classroom. Um, so I'll throw it over to uh, either of you. How common do you think this sort of story is? Is this what's happening in every classroom in Victoria or in Australia? Um, it's definitely not happening in every classroom. Uh, we, we can be certain of that. And um, you know, when I look at the, the, the name you've given to tonight's session, targeted teaching, how to close the gap between theory, policy and practice, I feel like just about anything we do could, could sit before that colon. Um, and I'm going to use Coralie as the example of how you do that because she's uh, beautifully woven those three things together. But what we don't have is that happening everywhere. Uh, that's the challenge, and uh, because it's hard, as you say. Um, what our, what's our role uh, sitting in the centre is how to make that easier. 
Uh, and a key part of making that easier is the data side of things, how to make it hard not to know these things. The, the point, uh, Peter, that uh, your report uh, really drew out beautifully was the spread of uh, achievement across a, across a classroom compared to uh, a teacher's perception of a spread of achievement across the classroom. And that role of data in drawing that out and making it abundantly clear that there is a much wider spread of achievement uh, and performance across a classroom. So, uh, without getting into an, uh, an unpaid uh, announcement, part of uh, yesterday's announcement uh, was... Let's do. <laughs> uh, ..was the, uh, the inside assessment platform that uh, I'm going to embarrass Ian Burridge in the fourth row and acknowledge uh, his work in uh, getting, uh, getting this up and, uh, uh, up and running and about to be rolled out and trialled uh, across schools in Victoria. But how to uh, get assessment tools, uh, high quality assessment tools, easily available and analytics that sit behind that uh, so that teachers are able to know the progress and improvement that individual students are making across their, their schooling years, uh, be able to know how their class as a whole is tracking, uh, to know where there might be gaps where, uh, where things are going well. And to make that easy, uh, take the time away from sitting there uh, and, and kind of extracting information and plotting it and doing kind of doing the, uh, the the Excel spreadsheet yourself to track these things, to make it really easy, to make it really accessible and to not be able to not know that information because that's that's the key first step uh, in being able to to harness that power. Now, it's not the only step by any stretch. There's, there's uh, a lot of skill uh, in implementing, but uh, you've got to know that you want to be doing it. You've got to know that it's an issue before you're going to uh, address those uh, address those issues. So, f for me, that's that's one of the, the great things that we can do sitting in the centre is to make that really easy, really accessible, to make it uh, student centred, to make it follow the student throughout their uh, their schooling life between schools, um, so that. Uh, we're putting the power into the hands of uh, teachers and principals to be able to, to know where kids are up to. That's something that I want to just pick up on. So if we want to see the progress of children they, in their learning, then we want to see that over many years. And uh, anyone who's been a parent will know that babies get weighed regularly and their height gets taken and that gets tracked. And we can see uh, that's a way of finding out if uh, the child is growing well, but that's best done when it's done over many years. Um, why is this hard as a, as a non-educator? Uh, Marjorie, m maybe you can help us understand why these things that we feel should be done are actually quite tough in practice. So, before I answer that question, I'd like to put a plug in for our teachers. I think there's fantastic expertise out there in school. Simon's absolutely right, is every school like Coral is? Absolutely not. But there are great practices going on. One of the things that AITSL is very committed uh, to doing and thinking about is trying to bring uh, those excellent practices to the fore so that the public, parents who have often great confidence in their own school but, but somehow less confidence in the education system can really see and understand and know what good practice looks like. And indeed, teachers can know what uh, great practice looks like. So one of the th reasons I think that uh, some of the things that one might think would be pretty obvious uh, don't happen is that teaching is a complex, complicated, non-linear business. And it's, in Australia, somewhat fragmented between independent Catholic and government schools. It varies between states and territories. So there's no clever answer to your question, Peter. I think, um, except that the business we're in is, is a complex and complicated one and, uh, and some of the systems and processes haven't kept up perhaps with the sorts of uh, things that we now know and understand are very important. I think that's right. It's this tension of um, the reality on the ground 
and then some desires of some things that are shown to be good practice. Could you talk to us a bit about the, what the policies and the pol uh, national professional standards say and how you see them ideally being used to close some of this uh, potential disconnect? So the standards provide for the first time in Australia a, a very coherent picture of what teachers should know and be able to do at the four levels. You leave university as a graduate when you work as a proficient teacher, as a highly accomplished and lead teacher. The standards won't make teachers better, but they're a great underpinning for teachers to talk about their practice, to have views about what, uh, what it means to get better at their practice and to allow uh, people into the business of teaching. So at ATSA we think that there are probably really three important uh, things that we want to achieve through policy th settings, th through providing people with tools and expertise, to uh, working with systems and sectors uh, like Simon's and indeed into schools like Coralie's. And one of those is to really um, make explicit and to revere the expertise of teachers. So in order to deal with that multiplicity of um, abilities and interests in a classroom, a teacher needs to be expert. They need to have a wide uh, range of uh, strategies in their repertoire and know how to apply them and know the impact that they're having and therefore how to adjust them. So one of the things that we think is really important is to continue to focus on building that expertise. Second is the professional conversations that take place between teachers. And we talk a lot about collaboration and mentoring and coaching. At the heart of all of these things, there is the, the uh, conversation that an, an individual has with their peer, with their principal, with a parent, uh, with the students themselves. So how do you make those conversations targeted and meaningful? And then the last thing, and we hear about it all the time, is the business of collaborative expertise. How can we work together to solve those practical problems that Coralie talks about, to understand uh, the impact that we are having, to have someone watch me while I work. So what, you know, what did happen to that with that bunch of kids there while I was paying attention to those? So they're the three things that we think are going to help uh, drive real improvement, real targeted teaching, a revering and a growth in expertise, deep um, and, and supported professional conversations, and then the notion of not, I'm not in it alone, I'm not reinventing you know, my work program every single day for every single child, but there's genuine collaboration and support. So I suspect that uh, across this panel there would be a very strong agreement with all of those and, and those last two particularly. It's about working together and building on professional conversations. The days when you could say that a teacher closed the, gently closed the door, there's a great quote in one of John Hattie's books, and then worked in isolation um, are certainly passing and, a, and leading into a different approach. Um, Coralie, how does that look in your school? I just want to pick up on that point of consistency that Simon made. The challenge isn't, it is not about consistency across our schools, but it's also consistency within our schools. Now, our research shows that, that, that that's our biggest challenge. Now, the points you just made, Marjorie, I think really help that. Those professional conversations, one of the key um, strategies we've used is that professional conversation with the principal or assistant principal, uh, either twice a term or once a term. Twice a term it was in Queensland and once a term in Victoria. The teachers come with, with a pro forma of those students in their classrooms that are performing above and below expected levels, what they're doing about it, what the data shows, what support they need. So that's one way of getting that consistency. The collaboration, I think collaboration time, used to be called planning time, must be built into the daily curriculum and also the leadership, the coaching, the coaching in the classrooms um, to support the teacher and that, that feedback in, in a, a respectful relationship. I don't know a teacher that doesn't come to work every day not wanting to do their very best, but sometimes they're just working on the wrong thing because they haven't been given the guidance or there's not the, the leadership structure there to support them. So I think that consistency within a school is where we have to start as well as across our system. So I'm going to change gear 
a little bit now. I think we've heard and hopefully got a bit of an understanding of what some of the goal is, but what some of the challenges are. Um, and certainly that there are pockets of fantastic practice out there and teachers working hard and working in new ways. I do think there is evidence that the educational outcomes that we're getting in Australia are not what we should be hoping for or potentially could be expecting. Um, and I'll bring in a couple of the pieces of data that if we compare ourselves at age 15 to some of the leading nations in the world, and I think there is no reason we should not compare ourselves, then we get roughly half as many students into the top levels of mathematics proficiency. We get, have more than twice as many students who are performing at the lowest levels of proficiency, which means that they're not, they are not necessarily being set up to succeed and thrive in life. And I think this is a challenge, that there are, the work on the ground is being pushed forward as hard as a, the individuals can, and yet as a system, we're not seeing the results. And so I'm interested in how some of these ideas and, and the, the, um, the national professional standards which reflect what is good practice and being done in so many places can become the norm, can become uh, the baseline that teachers bring their individual personality and relationships to, um, but that will actually shift the dial in terms of some of the results that we are seeing. So how do we move to building improvement on a broad way? Simon, I'm gonna start with you on that one. Wow, that, that, that's, that's an easy question. Um, <laughs> Um, again, I suppose if I, I, I kind of one, of one of the key parts of my job is to try and make things simple before we make them complex again, is um, teaching is basically a human interaction. So the, the way you're going to change it is by changing the, uh, what people are doing, uh, what teachers are doing and how they're interacting with their kids. How, how does that happen? Well, that that's a question of time and, you, and uh, using it well. Um, what uh, Coralie's pointed to about uh, working together within the school. Um, and again, as a, as a non-educator, kind of uh, thinking about all the best professional development I've ever had. And I've done some great courses, um, you know, studied some really interesting stuff, but all of the best professional development that sticks with me is having watched somebody who was really good at the job I wanted to do and has seen how they've done it um, and have them watch me do what I do and come to me with questions about how I was doing it, uh, what was I doing, what was I thinking when I did X, uh, you know, why did I take this approach, did I think about other approaches and really pushed me to think about it. The, the getting outside, getting, getting more of that, and it's, cl it's clearly shifting, but we need more still of that kind of interaction uh, within the teaching profession uh, is absolutely critical. So that, that, uh, that behaviour, that sharing of, of good practice, um, that, uh, and, and what that requires is trust and understanding. Uh, what that requires is um, practising uh, as a community. And these are all um, easy to say, but they're uh, really hard to embed in any organisation. It requires fantastic leadership, it requires, it requires system leadership, it requires local leadership, um, it requires the time to do it, and it requires the trust uh, and skill of uh, people within that organisation, in this instance a school, to, uh, to be able to execute that. Now, that, that both takes time on a daily basis, but it takes time on a policy cycle basis as well of we need to stick at these things. When we look, um, again, at systems that have improved, one of the key things is that you get a plan and you stick to it for at least 10 years, um, preferably 20 or 30, but at least 10 years. Um, to say this is what we're, we're going to do. We're not going to um, have um, policy attention deficit dis disorder and jump from one thing to another. So that, that clarity and consistency um, to be able to, to pick the things that work and uh, improve uh, within the organisational unit of school and classroom um, is, 
you know, they're, they're the ingredients, but the, the, it's there's there's no uh, no no magic way to get there. Nigel. So let me add two things to that. I think Simon's very right about all of those things. I think we need to focus on achievement and growth. So it's okay. not just um, you know where we get to, but how much uh, a student, a school, a system moves from here to here, uh, and and how how that's done. So there's a, you know an achievement and growth thing. Uh, also, I think Australia's done pretty well at focusing on the kids that were just below the benchmark. I think where we haven't serviced uh, ourselves and our country and our students well is those 40% of the high potentials that do pretty well, uh, but they're not stretched and they're, they're certainly not challenged in the way that they could be. And so they're in addition to the, and what, you know, what else do we need to do to, to improve uh, Australia's performance, I think it's growth, focus on growth as well as achievement and that real concentration on stretching those high potential kids. So then we have the question of what is the role of the system and what I was hearing Simon is that's not to try and define that wouldn't work given you said human teaching is a very human interaction. Um, it doesn't seem to be either to leave alone entirely um, and some may say that that, that has happened in some uh, um, Victorian schools over the last number of years that I think is moving away. But um, to Coralie, do you feel that you're getting enough support or what support would make the most difference to do these things that you're trying to do, to do the things that make the difference that have been described so well? Um, and uh, to both lift up the uh, students at the lower end and, very good point Marjorie, to stretch the students at the, at the top end. I agree Marjorie, very good point. That crisis of underachievement I've read you know, I've got that down. For many of our schools, it's, it's the coasting students and that stretching. It's, it's really important. I'm going to, I'm going to choose your, your three from your report, the time, tools and training, and add trust. I had added trust. So see how aligned we are in our thinking? The four Ts Working rather already. than three Ts. I think that's what schools need. And sometimes that is generated systemically. Sometimes it's just generated because the leaders or the school are innovative. Not everything does have to cost. It's about thinking differently about things. But of course, funding does help. If we're looking at time, we need time for um, the coaches, for those collaborative conversations to take place. For training, we do need training, but I would recommend the training happens as most as possible in the school environment. Looking at the Richard Elmore model of, you know, closer to the classroom, the bigger the difference. I think you know some people do need to have some external training, but to bring it back to the school, the more the school is aligned and in agreement about what we're doing, the more chances of success. And then the, the tools, we have fantastic tools already available to us. Some are quite costly, which is prohibitive for some schools. We just need to be thinking differently, auditing what the tools are available to schools and perhaps being supported a bit more in that area. And what we haven't mentioned also I think in relation to tools, is having a really good learning management system to have um, to be able to store that data that's collected, to be able to access it and to be able to present the information in really informative, interesting ways. Um, you know, we can't ignore um, so those levels, that range of levels within the classroom. Well, when a teachers actually visually see the range of levels, which we I've done on many occasions with data walls, and actually have the photos and names of those little students, and they actually see they've got you know five or six levels within their classroom, the impact is amazing, and you capture their interest, and that you know they know they've got to do something about that. So that visual presentation is really important as well. So the four four T's, I think. Um, very good. Are there, before we throw over to the audience questions, so uh, please start uh, getting your questions ready, um, what do you think the biggest barriers are? Are there any other biggest barriers that we haven't uh, raised here? Mm. I reckon there's a couple. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> I, I reckon there's, some, uh, we've got to be, you know, beware the fact that uh, all wisdom all change must be must come from the teacher. So there's something here about as we work, and you know, ASL's absolutely in this business. Work to improve the quality of teaching and school leadership. 
that we recognise that we actually do work in an ecosystem, to use the jargon, where a whole lot of people contribute and, and uh, there are a whole lot of resources and services out there. So I sort of think beware all wisdom and responsibility resides with the teacher, albeit that they are, you know, have the greatest in-school influence on kids. Um, beware the fact that if we could just find where a kid was at, then learning would keep going and it's, you know, if, if we only knew where to start, everything would be all right. So learning's it's not the data, it's the dialogue and what happens after that. Correct. So learning's not, uh, not uncomplicated and not linear. And uh, I think we do have to beware the over-test syndrome, you know, and I do think that perhaps some of our colleagues in the US would, would um, you know, be saying that to us loudly and clearly. So while these aren't barriers, they are, they are things I think we need to think about as we you know, with all the best intentions of the world, in the world trying to move into uh, an improved and improving system. I was going to say over-testing. That's why, you know, you need a, quite a clear, coherent assessment schedule to keep you honest, keep you on track, but to show we're not just grabbing stuff from everywhere. We are quite organised and we have a framework, so an assessment schedule is, is really, really important. Um, oh. I had, another, I had another brilliant idea, I'll just think about it. <laughs> Simon, one barrier. Uh, I actually want to hear from the people in this room as to what the barrier is for them, in particularly um, teachers and principals in the room. What, what can we do to help you? And I would like to just offer one, which is the reinvention of the wheel. Um, that there are lots of people thinking about these things. At some level, it has to be done with groups of teachers working together, um, understanding the challenges in front of them, and we've heard that. I also do think that there are some things that don't necessarily need to be done in schools. Um, one school that I have spoken to, going down this pathway, realised that to, uh, to understand the progress of their students, they needed to have um, what Coralie referred to of a learning progression, the fine-grained steps. They spent the next two years building one. Um, this is awesome on one level, but it's also a little horrifying on one level because that's technical, expensive work. Um, and what would have been the difference if they had spent that two years taking one off the shelf and really understanding it and saying, how does it apply here? What can I do about it to move forward? So a lot is known. It's, we're not starting from scratch. Um, but with that, over to you. Are there questions or comments on what the real barriers are or your questions to any of this fantastic panel? And we have a, down in the second row, there are microphones around, so uh, please, if you could wait until they get to you. Lady in the second row. Um, I feel like that all of the theory sounds, you know, completely reasonable, and I think all teachers know the theory now. However, it seems like there's a lot of extra things that are being asked. Um, I was just writing down some things like differentiation, um, giving feedback, <coughs> data entry, like analysing the data, um, having time to reflect on your own practice, collaborating, planning, and all of that's going up. And I don't feel like, certainly not at the school that I'm teaching at, um, that there's too much give in that in terms of being able to actually do that effectively. We're given, what is it, two, well, it's meant to be 2.5 hours is still the recognised amount of time. And I don't really see how we can get around that if it's not acknowledged that there is actually more work that we need to do to be able to do it effectively. So teaching is in fact a busy job and simply expecting more is a recipe for failure. I would agree. Um, that's why time is the first of the now four Ts. Um, what I saw in some of the case study schools is that they uh, brought in some extra resources to help with that, and that was uh, something that was funded. Um, they shifted around playtime, um, who had to be on duty during um, playground use. They redirected professional learning, um, but the time to do it was always one of the uh, biggest elements. So uh, what else have we seen in terms of 
making it realistic and not just asking more and more and more, what can be taken away to enable this? I'm not sure it's always more. Sometimes it's just doing things differently. But Brian Caldwell always talks about how bad we are in schools of abandoning everything. So that's one thing we did was did an audit of all the extras we were doing and decided on what we can abandon, what things weren't really part of our culture, what our ex expectations were. Um, that's where the funding's important too, to be able to provide these collaboration times, this planning time, that's important. And we're lucky in Victoria because we do have a fair bit of flexibility in our, in our budget, in our financial management compared to other states. So again, it's about thinking differently, being innovative. Rick Hess wrote this fantastic book called Cage Busting Leadership. And it's about thinking differently about what you really want to achieve and how you can get around it and do it. And that's sort of driven me to, to think like that. I mean, I'd love to have some of my teachers here and, and he, have them respond to your question because I think they would say, if we're just doing things differently because, because of all the reasons I've mentioned already, we're doing it together, being aligned and going on this journey together. It's never been a top-down model. And, you know, there's always that dilemma, that, that sense of urgency to get it done. But unless you take people with you, it's not going to be sustainable and long-lasting. So I think, you know, I think that's what they would say. The, the, the decisions have been done together and we've abandoned things along the way and looked at what our work in a different way, not a more. And just one more thing from before, I think um, what our system can do is consistency in message. At the school level, sometimes you get mixed messages about what priorities are in schools. And when you've been around a while, like me, you can work out what, you know, is, is relevant to your school and your culture and what you're doing and just ignore the rest. But some new, new principals, new um, leaders do get confused. So I think our system needs to be consistent. And I think I've mentioned noted some phrases in um, the education state which link directly back to the concept of targeted teaching. So if that can continue, we'll be on the right track. Um, endorse uh, all of uh, what Coralie said from, from the coalface of, of uh, implementing it. I suppose it's uh, given the importance and the, the effectiveness of the assessment intervention uh, we can't afford not to be doing it. So it's a question of what, what else are we not doing instead? Uh, that the, it's, it's a resource prioritisation question in any organisation of um, leaders need to be willing to say, and this is more important and we're going to do less of something else which is not having the same return. And um, Grattan uh, previously uh, produced a, a report that, that went into some detail on this that, uh, that I'd I'd kind of really draw out as, a, as um, a great practical piece of work about how do we prioritise within an organisation to say, are we always focusing on the thing that's going to have the greatest return? Um, it's a discipline we all need to have. I need to have it as a manager of uh, my bit of an organisation to say, I'm, I'm very good at saying that would, be, that would be good to do as well. I'd really like to do that as well. And then I need to start taking some things out of the bottom and saying, actually, we're going to run a line through that and we're not doing that anymore. And that that's, needs to come from the leadership. That report, by the way, is called Making Time for Great Teaching. It was by my predecessor and it focuses on this issue because all of the things we ask, there has to be time from somewhere. Audrey? I think you've nailed one of the biggest issues that, that we have, uh, you know, and I don't... Uh, I think these are all entirely appropriate answers. I think that they don't play out necessarily that way in schools all the time. There's the issue, you know, this, uh, one of the dilemmas and one of the questions that AITSOL keeps asking itself is there's that many tools and that many things available that should indeed make teachers' lives easier. They don't have to reinvent them. They don't have to make up their own test or their own, you know, lesson sequence or whatever it is. And yet I don't think that that often happens. So how do we, how do we help uh, teachers like you to make... Uh, choices about the materials that they have without trawling through a whole lot of resources. So I guess all I'm saying is I have absolute sympathy with your position. I think it's a, it's a response or it's a, it's a, a trial or a, a dilemma that we haven't um, quite uh, come to terms with yet and, and I think will always continue um, to beset us. 
Uh, you know, maybe it's, it's sort of that perils of professional autonomy when we think we have to do everything ourselves and we have to, you know, do it for every single child differently. That's one of the things we have to overcome. Could I pick up on that and give one very practical example that we saw in the school that we call Brightvale in the report? They were using the same material for understanding student learning. They were gathering the information every day in the classroom and they were marking it down and questioning each other about how do we know that a student can do that. After three years, they had the common language. They were using the same way of doing it. And that started to make the day-to-day -day discussions a little more effective and efficient, and that starts to get to some of the time bit. They knew what they were looking for once they were all working in the same way. And then there was another fascinating piece. When the students moved year, they told us they didn't have to spend the first six or seven weeks figuring out who was in their classroom, what level did they know, what level did I have to teach. They were using the same way of thinking about learning as we was used the previous year. They had all of that data, they knew it, they trusted it. They said they got going with targeted teaching for every student in year two, uh, sorry, in week two of the, of the term. Um, and they had bought themselves effectively five or six weeks by the way that they had got working together in terms of maximising the learning, the efficiency I talked at the beginning. From week two, every student was being taught at the level they needed to. That took them time to get there, but they reckoned it was worth it. Next questions, please. Um, down here on the right. Um, I've been teaching in classrooms for over 30 years and I don't profess to have any answers as to being the perfect model of a teacher. However, I've started to wonder whether um, teacher knowledge is one of the biggest issues that we, well, personally I grapple with because there's been so many changes that I wonder whether we need to think differently and maybe specialise in primary schools. I, so that where this young lady was talking about taking the load of so many things, that I find that although I have less commitments at home and things to my fellow teachers, I still battle with um, designing the, you know, having the perfect lessons because there's so much that I have to learn myself, especially perhaps in the computer area. And I just think maybe if there was a, a way we could collaborate so that someone has that expertise that it takes that load of teacher knowledge from me and I maybe do maths and I know it's easier than said than done, but maybe that's another way we might be able to take a bit of pressure off um, so two parts to that question. It strikes me one is about the specialisation and the need to actually understand hopefully more than your students and where it's going next. But secondly, also preparing the materials and especially preparing them in an unfamiliar way. Um, who would like to take you? Marjorie. I think it's what, exactly what I was referring to, that the peril of professional autonomy. I have to do everything myself every time and you know, I have to do it better than last time. So I think there is something very much in that notion of collaboration. I'll do this piece, you do that piece, we can combine and, and in that combination we, we become better. Um, I definitely, uh, again, one of my kind of outsider observations is when I, uh, is just the, the transition between primary and secondary and the, uh, the, the, really sharp distinction and the benefits from uh, for each of picking up some of the other's strengths. So the, the specialisation um, being brought in particularly into the upper years of primary and some of the more pastoral care uh, and continuity in, uh, in the lower years of secondary, that feels like a very sharp divide uh, when I'm going in and visiting primary schools versus visiting secondary schools. Um, so there, um, it's something that we're absolutely uh, interested in. Uh, primary maths and science specialists um, announced yesterday uh, you know, at one end, but also thinking about that uh, that uh, remaking uh, to some degree of the the mode of uh, secondary education to uh, to br bring in some more of that pastoral care, more of that uh, individual understanding. Uh, in that, in that, what is a very sharp transition when you think about it from the perspective of the child. 
I'm thinking, whether it's right or wrong, that perhaps the emphasis shouldn't be so much on the, the knowledge and the content, but more on the um, implementation, more on the pedagogy, because the knowledge content can come from the internet and it's... actually thinking of the content I was just thinking that that you can't that even teaching just say comp um, computer technology and that there's people that have got so much more um, scope to teach it better than what I believe I can do myself so why wouldn't we try as a I think Marjorie did sort of yes so that we're kind of working more in collaboration as I say it's very easy to say without being you know the one in charge of doing but that would take a lot of pressure off so that you do become a little bit more expertise and know where you're taking the children to that's as a as it's not worth a considering world. but yeah. no one's doubting the complexity of, of the teaching role it's it's absolutely huge and the daily interactions but yeah it's probably something worth considering yeah. and I think that we've got into a mode where there's almost a paradox of choice if, particularly if you're talking about, say, computer coding, I suspect there's a program out there to help do that. In fact, I suspect there's probably hundreds of them, if not thousands. And Marjorie pointed out earlier that that's not necessarily the most helpful. Um, and therefore, finding ways of saying, what are the good bits? What are the things that are really going to make things easier? What do you need to know about them? Um, in a slightly different space, I'll uh, give a shout out to uh, Victoria here. Um, and Social Ventures Australia, they've put in place an Australian teaching and learning toolkit, which is about some of the pedagogies, but very, very practical. What are the good bits? What does it take to implement them? Maybe if for some of these areas there was a curated list of what are the good bits? Which ones can you jump into quickly? That might help save some of the time. Next question, I believe there was one well up the back. Um, where are we? Over there, on the far left. Hi, what about personalities in classrooms rather than just knowledge or content? If you've got uh, someone with a very uh, lower than average understanding of the issues, um, you might have someone with uh, ADD, you might have someone that's just has a low attention span or various issues like this. How do you deal with those in your targeted teaching program? I'll give my answer while the uh, panel thinks through. I think the targeted teaching of recognising that there's a spread um, can reach a very large number of students, but I'm not saying that it can reach every student, whether their learning is outside the ends of that, on either, on either end, or whether they have very special needs. I think there will always be a need for specialists who can provide sort of second tier support, maybe an auditory processing thing, or very highly specialised support. In the targeted teaching, I would want to see as many students as possible well supported at their level so that those specialists actually are dealing with hopefully a smaller number of students and they're, they're very, uh, very highly skilled and very valuable. Um, that's how I would see them fitting together. It's no panacea, but others? If your underpinning philosophy is that all students can learn, that learning just looks different across your classroom. And those students that need more intervention because of special needs, their learning just looks different to the others. I'm not saying it's easier, it's difficult, but all students can learn in my, my belief. And we know that having the belief that all students can learn leads to better outcomes. So it's really about um, making the, the spread, uh, the, the the spread that a teacher can uh, reach as wide as possible. This is a discussion that um, Jill Duncan, who's uh, here tonight and leading the review of the program for students with disabilities in Victoria, and I've been talking about is how do you, uh, it, that tar targeting teaching at the high end, uh, very similar to targeting it at the low end and being able to push that spread out as far as you can, acknowledging um, Pete's point that there there will be limits to that, that that's, that's probably not a hundred percent but it's how far can you do that to make the schooling system as inclusive as possible for as many kids because uh, as, as many kids going to the same school in the same classroom uh, is a good in itself uh, so uh, yeah just pushing pushing the spread as wide as we can okay, I'm going to go up to the back row Sorry, going to go up to the back row in the middle and then uh, next to about five rows down, lady with the dark hair. 
Um, good evening. My name. Uh, um, my question is really for Coralie. Um, I'm really interested in some of the strategies that you've used um, in implementing this um, at uh, your school. Um, but specifically, I'm wondering what sort of strategies you've used to engage your parent and carers um, in this conversation, uh, because I think that this needs uh, very specific leadership. Um, and you've described that in the way that you've taken it to your teachers with the photos. Um, I think that that's just so powerful, but I'm wondering, yeah, how you have engaged your parent community in this conversation. Yeah, good question. Um, this probably the concept started from our, our strategic plan being focused on personalised learning and that being such an abstract concept, what it actually looked like in classrooms. So by using this targeted teaching approach, we could actually identify, well, this is one way. I, mean, I know personalised learning is a bit broader than that, but this is one um, identifiable way. The, the teachers, our, our school community is 100% um, professional families, so their expectations are very high. And so going back to empowering, enabling the teachers to have got those high level conversations with our, with our community um, was, was one of the great advantages of, of targeted teaching. So it's about keeping them informed, having good communication channels. We surveyed our community uh, 2014 about our reporting processes, got very, very strong negative feedback about some of the things. Report reports, didn't like the format, didn't like the narratives, didn't like the three-way conferences, which we involved the students, which we thought were brilliant. So we had to really accept that feedback and change a lot of our practices. And we've kept the targeting teaching concept at the centre of all those changes and keep, keep referring back to them, why we've done the changes, how that supports what they wanted, that information, that can that concept of continuous reporting, again, a new um, learning management systems enabling us to do that. So it's taking them on the journey as partners, true partners. You know, I really talk, you know, you have schools talking about this partnership, this meaningful partnership with parents, but then really when it comes down to it, no, we know, we know better, we're the professionals. We try to avoid that at all times and um, keep the communication flowing. Any comments from the panel on how this might look in a community that was not full of professional parents where a teaching and education was maybe not a first priority, yet it is equally important, we know, to try and get parents involved and to ideally to build focus and, and to celebrate growth and the progress of their students. Any thoughts? Um, that's a really tough nut to crack. Um, that, uh, again, when it works, it makes a huge difference, but the evidence around what works is pretty thin on that front. Um, we've been doing some work uh, with the Mitchell Institute uh, around some case studies around how do you get deeper community engagement in low SES communities. Um, and that really does take uh, time and resources uh, and uh, some really active outreach and again, building of trust. When it, when it works, it's, it's absolutely fantastic, but uh, gee, it's, it's, it's hard and, uh, and, and probably less, uh, less evidenced than most areas of policy in, in, uh, in schools. I, I visited a very low socioeconomic school recently because they were doing targeted teaching, uh, specifically in maths, but I wanted to learn more about it. And I found their key to success there was having high expectations of every single student in their school. And I thought I was walking into a, a non-government school in an eastern region area. It, they were so proud of what they were doing, facilities, the focus on the learning and the outcomes they were getting. But I asked the principal and she said it was all, about, all related back to having high expectations of every single student and family. I think we've got time for uh, two last questions. So we had one here, five rows down, the lady with the dark hair, um, and then we're going to go to um, Ellen over here. Hi, um, my first question is about class sizes and how you think that affects targeted teaching. Um, my second relates to like best practice, whether you suggest doing it in the one class or like what we're doing at our school, separating the levels. So during maths time, they go into ability groups with different teachers. Thanks. 
class size. Um, I think there's a really clear answer in relation to class sizes. If teachers teach a class of 30 the same way as they teach a class of 15, then the class size makes no difference. And the, um, there's a huge amount of evidence to show that teachers actually don't really change their methodologies. So you might as well be teaching 40 kids as 15. Where teachers change their methodologies, where they spend more time working uh, individually with students, where they uh, use group work differently, all of those things, then of course uh, there's a capacity to capitalise on the smaller numbers, although there's further evidence that suggests that in order to get the peer interaction, the um, you know, the, the community going in a classroom, then it shouldn't be too small. But the biggest issue with class sizes is not necessarily the size of the class, it's that the, it's that the teacher doesn't change the way that they, uh, that they teach, uh, regardless of class size. Uh, your second question was about... <coughs> oh, streaming. Again, the evidence is really strong that it's very, very useful to put kids into a clinic group or a small group to teach them a particular concept that they're struggling with. But ability grouping or streaming largely doesn't change. So practice is that kids get put into those streams and they stay there forever. And in fact, often they apply across subject areas and that's incredibly damaging to capacity, uh, students' capacity for extension, for change and for growth. So, of course, um, as I said, that sort of, I've got a problem, I don't understand this, so we're going to pull those kids together and, you know, give them quite explicit instruction around that, um, is very different from ability grouping where there's little capacity for students to change and, there is a, there, and expectations are set for them. And I would wholeheartedly second, second this. We did a lot of work into saying, what does the evidence say in this? Streaming is one of the few things that, a lot, that seems to actually have a negative impact overall um, because of the stigmatisation and some of those issues. So we say in the report, you can't solve this problem by splitting up the kids. You have to face it head on. In terms of the groupings, if you have eight levels, over eight year levels worth of learning in your classroom, that's really hard for one adult, even if you're doing the flexible groupings in that ideal way that you talked about, Marjorie. We saw, we saw schools that did bring classes together, two, sometimes three classes, and then on the day they would split up into the groups of, of the right level for that task. But when you have eight year levels of different groups and three adults in the room, that's actually a lot easier to do than for to have one adult in the room. So they had used it well and they really had changed their pedagogy. Um, last quick question and I, I'll hope it's a quick one and then I will wrap up so that we can get you out of here on time. So second row. Um, I Alice. just wondered what the role of new creative technologies have because it hasn't actually been mentioned. So I will even give an example of just recently hearing a bunch of teachers talking about how they were using Facebook, et cetera, to bring parents in. You know, in my day, of course, we all tried to get parents to come to the school, but these new ways, and equally, not just tests, but these new games that are available through Math Pathways, through Teach for One, which actually free up the capacity of teachers, it seems to me, and to actually allow kids to be teaching themselves. Um, so that we are on the cusp of something that actually can t lighten the load or um, multiply it. So educational technology, a whole different policy pitch sometime, but a very brief response from our panel. I think it's crucial, crucial to embrace it. The opportunities are huge. The apps that we use for our assessment are, are vast. Uh, Nearpod, um, um, iDocio, a lot of the teachers use. I think we need to embrace it. We could talk all night about you, right. Students, I saw two prep students the other day, one teaching the other one how to do little groups of, and the third one was, was filming it on, it on the iPad. Teacher put it on the interactive whiteboard. The three of them got out the front and they taught the rest of the class what they were doing. The power of peer tutoring. I mean, I just the, the opportunities are huge. Simon? Uh, I, and I, I agree and think that is the right way into it because uh, just speaking from a government perspective, trying to become, uh, trying to out Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley is 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 probably a path to rack and ruin. I just concur. 
And I'm going to put a, a, a very slightly different view here. I think there is tremendous potential, but in order to use these technologies well, the teachers need themselves to understand all of these things. The teachers need to be able to do this on their own, and then the technology can be an enhancement and know when to be done. Um, I think that the, uh, the allure of a program that can take this and differentiate for, to exactly where every student is um, sounds very powerful and, uh, and done well. It will be great, done poorly. There are risks there. So my call would be to say this actually demands the, the highest level of professionalism from teachers in order to use it. Um, and we cannot get risk going down the pathway of saying that the technology will solve it because we will never get away from those human interactions that we have heard about so much to enable every student to be learning at the right level, to be engaged in their learning, to experience what it feels like to have success. And something we haven't talked about tonight is that when students feel that experience of success, <coughs> then they build confidence, then they build resilience, and that sets them up for the world. So there's a new world coming, um, and it needs both. Thank you very much for taking the time to uh, come and join us this, this evening. Thank you very, very much to my panel. Um, I will wrap it up there and look forward to uh, joining you hopefully at a future policy pitch. <laughs> <laughs>